Jimmy Sabori came to me on the 16th of December of 1999. And he talked about this wonder engine he knew about, he had worked with and was with. There's lots of story on the internet. Basically, the beginning of the story, my involvement in, uh, in the PAP, recovering the PAP situation. Yeah? An engine which you can go in the future with our engine in your car, 100 times to New York and back, no gasoline. That's what we do. Mr. Klosterman, this engine was originally from an idea of Joseph Papp's engine, but you have altered the design of Joseph Papp's engine. Can you tell me, what is the fuel for your engine? The fuel is, can be the inert gases, as Pap says, but I have already said in 2003 and reported in Infinity Energy magazine, and my patent is based on it, that we can use just plain air. Through the magic of what Heinz and I are doing here, we're going to create uh, a kinetic energy out of uh, air. A little bit of voltage, of course. The air is consisting of oxygen, 21%, and 90, 79% is hydrogen, and the rest of it is all the other gases, including all the six inert gases, and one is radon. Pap knew, in my opinion, that air works too. Okay? And that his engine in Florida worked on air. But he, he didn't tell everybody who visited, he said he had inert gas in there. But that's why he wanted to just demonstrate, boy, it's very complicated, so he took a glove box, gloves, yeah, put the parts in, close the door, puts iron in it, and then he manipulates and then film it. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do it with oil and all of this. But in reality, he said, you, I fool you, I do it completely different. Yeah, that's what I believe, what I see and what, is really what, what I have done here. Yeah. Everybody into the PAP engine and started that way, but as we look into the engine, yeah. there's a cylinder in a piston, and it goes up and down. That, there's tremendous forces up there, and there is no way the noble gases will stay in there. Maybe it would do like, go up and down maybe 100 times maximum, and the gas would be gone. It's just natural leak. Natural leak, leak out. out. If it's in a balloon, a sealed balloon, it will leak out. It will permeate out. It will come out slowly. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And from that point of view, it's a, mm, this thing is just not going to cut it. There's something that's not right. We went to investigate. Everybody went so, right. We took okay. a left turn. So if you take it from that assumption, then that it leaks. It can't have. And Pep himself has in the patent that you should have bellows to seal the engine completely, the gas. But the bellows at that time, and even today probably, cannot last long because due to the cycling, well, I think what it is, it's not nuclear, I think it's normal physics, known for almost 100 years, but it has not been used. The application was already demonstrated by PAP. <laughs> mm -hmm. You turn the air into a plasma, and then you put a high currents of the plasma and that produces the power to fly a piston. I say it is conventional physics. It's known for 100 years, over 100 years, right, that you can take two electrodes and you put a voltage on the electrodes and then if you can initiate the, the gas between the electrodes and you have the voltage on, then you get current flow. The electrodes have voltage so they can touch them and you get connection. You can turn a light on. That is done in any neon light. Arcing is arc welding. So if you, and it's known, two students are taught in classes just to measure the breakdown voltage across an electrode, and they just touch the, elect the two pieces, they touch it and then they move it apart. And when it stops, that is the breakdown voltage principle. So millions of people do this every day. They're working. 
but in the principle of pair, what they discovered, apparently, I believe they discovered, that you can use the arc for producing power. And that's what PAP did. Yeah. All the people working in fusion, hot fusion, uh, finding out, like the Livermore was this big uh, NIF, National Ignition Facility is, which cost $20 billion to build in Livermore. And they take a 192 lasers, aiming them on a hairline pin, and melt the material. The, for doing this, they, for instance, they use gases and they ignite it or they pulse it, so they turn on the gas and put it into a plasma state. Right? They can bring the gas from a normal state, gas state, into a plasma state in nanoseconds. But it is so simple. You put between here and here, there you put Perhaps has 24 volts, but I know 24 volts don't work, but how he did it, I, that's fine, I don't know for sure, but he said you put DC 24 volts, okay. nothing happened. For a thousand years, nothing will happen. But if you ionize this air, just in here, not here, just in here ionized, then you get conduction. And once you get conduction, it doesn't stop. Okay. It stays on forever. Or something melts or something burns up. But the thing is, this gets very hot. So when you turn it off, co molecules in the arc collapse, you know, relax. Now they are part of the chamber. If PAP contained, when the plasma collapses, that it doesn't touch the walls, right? How could he do it? With a magnetic field, right? That's what they do in a tokamak. We don't know whether he did, but we can control it with a magnetic field. Okay. What you are going to see today is um, the pulsing of plasma. Okay, so we're just using plain air, nothing more, nothing fancy. So hopefully in the future we don't need gasoline it is because of this. Okay, one, two, three. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> What if they flew straight, <laughs> tore this thing apart? What's the uh, this weight? Is on, what's about the weight a little bit over a pound. Say what? A little bit over a pound. About 1.1 1, 1. 1 pounds. 1.1 1. 1 pounds. Shoot it in here. It's about the size of a small can of peas or something. Uh, yes, yes, it's 3 inches by 3 inches. 3 inch diameter. 3 inch diameter. What is making the, what pushes that out? We know what we do, we don't want to tell. Not yet. We know. People say it can't even work. Yes. Okay, one, two, three. This is a piston. So it's yeah. like the air is expanding and it pops that Whatever. Out. Whatever is in there, we don't tell the detail. Here, Ruby. Oh. But there's, there's nothing, nothing in there. there. Watch. Let's take a look. How much energy is that spark? Very little. We can adjust it. Less than 1,000 joules per pulse, but even we can go to 20, 30, 40, 50 joules per pulse. Are you, you're using a battery? This is a 12 volt battery. Regular 12 volts you can buy from Radio Shack anywhere. And a, a little inverter, a little cheapy inverter, nothing fancy. And we're pushing this at atmospheric pressure. There's no, we don't pressurize it, we don't put any gas, it's just whatever air is in there. 
But he uh, can do even much better. There's no air in there, it's just plain air, no gases, no nothing. And he can do even the future much better. Okay, yeah. so no, from a 12-volt uh, battery, okay. in the magic box. So the 12 volts is applied to the magic box. Right. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. We are not shooting more than 600 joules at the moment, mm -hmm. but I can bring it up to much more or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So measure the voltage. How much? 500. So 500 times 500 is okay. 250,000 divided by 225,000. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Here is the ending book. 160 ending voltage. Okay, that we have to write down now. 500 volts. So you go and uh, out of the battery, you charge up to 500 volts, and then you discharge, and you have remaining. You saw that with the instrument, right? Mm -hmm. And every every scientist knows that. Yeah. So with that, okay. what we are doing? So now we are putting the 500 volts on these two electrodes. Okay. Nothing happens when. When this do is because it's an open circuit, right? So the R key, this is all full of air. Okay? So now we trigger it, so then we put here the M through it, yeah? So the current goes through here and discharges the capacitor. Now you're putting some electricity in. Are you getting over unity? I say yes, but I have not instrumentation that I can definitely show it. I can, with an engine I want to build, and it can do this in three months, and it can produce electric, I can put electricity in, and get electricity out, and it will be over unity. Pulse, and, and the arc, once you trigger the arc, it's like a short circuit. The resistance is very, very low. So you get very high currents, okay? So now you have to find vehicles to control the current that you get now. And ideally, so if you want to ask for instance, you take 1000 volts and you take 100 amps, that is 100,000 volts, right? Per milliseconds you get therefore 1000 volts, uh, you get 100 joules in a millisecond. So you have 10 milliseconds, millisecond, not second, 10 milliseconds, you get 1000 joules. We showed you today that we has to do this with sound joules. And there's still a lot of joules left because it only discharges down to 160 watts. Okay? So there's no magic to it, but you have to have the right instrumentation and control, and that has been the problem. And then I put here a control mechanism on it that I can pulse at a millisecond, two milliseconds, so, and I do this 30 times, then I have. Uh, or 60 times and they have the best implosion, ex explosion engine with a piston. An air pump to fill your bicycle tire with air, then you push the plunger down, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go back and you push it back down. Mm -hmm. It has a leather V uh, seal that when you push it down, it puts it against the wall and therefore you have a seal and you can pump the air in. When you push it back, the air passes by because it is in the opposite direction. Now, if I put my thumb on it and I have the plunger all the way down and you pull it, what happens? You can't do it because you get suction, right? That's why I came up with the three piston jet engine. This is basically a piston, and you use your pulser attached to that to move the and piston. And this is a future working engine which will produce electricity that goes here and a stator around it, and it therefore has a, an alternator inside. And now, what you do is, you do this, you have a stroke length of, let's say, a centimeter. And at high speed, you get, if you move a magnet, 
in a coil at a very high speed and things become very easier and you can make much easier electricity with lower weight components and all of this that has so much opportunity that thousands of engineers will have dream up new things. So that is a, what is called a flying piston engine. So here's a chamber and here's a chamber so we pulse this one, shoot it this way and this way, back and forth and you have a what is called a flying, a free piston generator. So you have pulsers on each side, just basically... Yeah, according to my patent. If you read my patent, that's in my patent. Okay. If you call the Blarigan engine from Liver, from Sandia Lab in Livermore, they have spent 20 millions of dollars by the U.S. government on this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But they can't get it working because it works on fossil fuels. But mine works on air or on inert gases. The first unit we want to build, and we can do this within a half a year, a really functioning unit, or a year, let's say, because the U.S. government has paid already a lot of money by the uh, a laboratory in Livermore so that we have the engine to go, so we only have to adapt it with our pulses, and then we have a 50 kilowatt generator. Bill and um, Peter Van Blergen got the patent on the what they call the free piston generator. And the principle is based on what they call HCCI. They, on the U.S. Congress was involved in it. They provoked money and General Motors, Ford and Chrysler and Mercedes, they all were involved in, in the whole world. Okay. HCCI, you remember, had cost $50 billion dollars in research and development by the world community, science community, and they have failed. They can't get it working. Okay? HCCR. Okay? That is an engine, but what Livermore did, Sandia did, they developed the electrical generator, and so there's a lot of value in it. So if I take now the Livermore engine, which it doesn't work, and I put my two chambers which I showed you there on it, then you have an engine. So we have this working, Livermore has that working, and put it together, you have a working engine specified for the whole industry in the world, 50 kilowatts. Well, let me just ask Tam before he leaves, uh, how soon do you think you'll have an engine ready to go? Oh, Far that's a away, tough one. That's, that's a tough one. It really depends on uh, mm -hmm. our, our next round of investment when it, when it comes in mm -hmm. and uh, what the investors want from it and where they want to take it. Do you see that you have the technology ready you just need the investment to put it together, or is there still more some R&D? No, there's, there's going to be more R&D. There, mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot more R&D, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to come up with a prototype, you yeah, might have a working prototype, optimistically, six months. You know. mm -hmm. That's uh, that's if everything goes like pop. We have single cylinder, we have two and a four. So uh, we're, we're doing every which way that we can to make this thing work. But the, the core technology is what you witness. That is the core technology. There's other stuff that goes in there in order to uh, increase the power out. It's really amazing from, from our beginnings and what we first found out to what you saw today. The money spent on hot fusion, on HCCI and all of this to find a way to get better efficiency or better economy out of eliminating fossil fuels. And Pap did it, we know he did it, yeah? And I believe I have the technology and we should, I say there should be a Marshall Plan, Marshall Plan to support this. And I'm willing to give it to the public.